We're officially beginning. So we do have our attendees joining in the chat, just giving okay. them a moment to get logged in. Um, and before we get started, I will be sharing a few housekeeping rules. So all of the okay. attendees are now rolling in. So gotcha. welcome everybody. Thank you so much. And we will go ahead and get started. So hello everyone, welcome to the University of North Florida's virtual connect with UNF transfer admissions articulation workshop. My name is Elena Karras and I am the admissions event specialist here at the University of North Florida and we are thrilled to have you here today. During this event, you'll get to hear from our UNF admissions and the various academic colleges that will share information that is relevant for your students who are interested in transferring to UNF. You'll have the chance to engage with our passionate faculty and dedicated staff who are committed to providing a exceptional and transforming educational experience. Now, before we get started, I wanted to conduct some housekeeping and share with you some tools that you will have available during this event. Make sure to use the Q&A feature. It should be a button at the bottom of your screen. Each of our college presentations today will consist of about a 20 minute presentation of information and a 10 minute Q&A where you will be able to ask any questions you may have for each of our presenters. For a brief overview of our presentations today, we will be starting with our Office of Admissions, followed by college presentations by our Brooks College of Health, Coggin College of Business, College of Arts and Sciences, College of Computing, Engineering and Construction, and lastly, our College of Education and Human Services, and then finally concluding the event with closing remarks. We hope you enjoy our virtual event this morning, and please do not hesitate to ask any questions during our Q&As throughout the duration of the event. Now, to kick off our presentations, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Lauren Beyer, an admissions recruiter here at the University of North Florida that will be sharing with you all what the process to transfer to UNF looks like. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well this morning. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. So that way we can go ahead and get started with our presentation. Um, like Elena said, my name is Lauren Beyer. I'm an admissions recruiter here in the Office of Admissions at the University of North Florida. Uh, I specifically cover Jacksonville and the surrounding counties. So if you are happen to be a counselor local to the area, be more than willing and happy to help you out. But I'm also more than willing to help out with any other counselors in um, any region of the state of Florida. Um, to kick things off for the presentation, first I want to go over the different types of transfer applicants we have here at UNF for or, and the different types of applicants in general. First, we have our first time in college students, and a first time in college student is going to be any student applying to the university that has earned less than 12 credit hours after high school graduation. So there are some students I'm aware of that do earn their associate's degree before transfer before coming to UNF, if they've earned that associate's degree in high school, they are going to be a first time in college student. Next, we have our lower level transfer students and a lower level transfer student is going to be any student that has earned 12 to 29 transferable credit hours after high school graduation. Next, we have our mid-level transfer students, which is any student that has earned 30 to 59 transferable college credit hours after graduation, and then lastly, our upper level transfer students. An upper level transfer student is going to be any student that has earned 60 or more credit hours after high school graduation, or if you've earned an associate's degree after high school graduation. First, covering the application materials required for lower level transfer students that are applying to the University of North Florida. Firstly, we do require these students to submit their UNF online application. They can do this very easily through the UNF admissions website. Next, they are required to submit the $30 application fee or a fee waiver form if they're eligible. Usually students that are eligible for that fee waiver form are Pell Grant eligible and they would just have a financial aid officer at their current institution help them fill that out and then they, they will submit that fee waiver over to the University of North Florida. Those students are also required to submit their college transcripts from any institution they have earned credits from after high school graduation, as well as their high school transcripts in an SAT, ACT, and or CLT test score, and we do super score those tests. So those students are more than welcome to submit all of the score reports that they've earned after taking those tests, and we're only going to take the best scores from each section no matter how many times they've taken the test. 
Next, we have our mid-level transfer students, and a mid-level transfer student is going to be any student that has earned 30 to 59 credit hours after high school graduation, as I mentioned previously. And for these students, they need very similar materials to a lower-level transfer student. So they're still required to submit that UNF online application via um, the UNF admissions website that $30 application fee or a fee waiver form if eligible, their college transcripts from any institution they have earned college credit hours after high school graduation. Um, and if they are wanting to um, not submit their SAT or ACT test scores, they can, um, when they submit their college transcripts, we will evaluate to see if they have completed both a college level English and a college level math with a C and or higher in both. Or if they do happen to have their SAT, ACT, or CLT test scores, they're more than welcome to submit their test scores along with their high school transcript that has a 2.5 recalculated admissions GPA present. Students can do either pathway depending on what materials they have that are available to them. Next, we have our upper level transfer students. And an upper level transfer student, as I mentioned before, is any student that has earned 60 or more credit hours after high school graduation, or if they've earned an associate's degree after high school graduation. And for those students, we do require them to have a completed UNF online application, their $30 application fee or a fee waiver form, and then their college transcripts from any institution they have earned credit hours from after high school. This slide is just a really great timeline to keep in mind for your students. Definitely feel free to make note of this if you're interested or you think it might be a good resource for you. Um, but this is just a very good timeline to keep in mind of dates and deadlines for UNF and for the transfer process. So February 1st of this year was when our spring 2024 transfer application opened and it is still open. Our August First was the summer 2024 transfer application opening and our fall 2024 application for transfer students will open up on October 1st. November 1st is the spring 2024 transfer application deadline for any students that are wanting to transfer to UNF in the spring. Uh, Early December is when we believe that FAFSA, that free application for federal student aid will open up. April 1st would be the um, summer 2024 transfer application deadline and July 1st is our fall 2024 transfer application deadline. All of these deadlines are subject to change, so we do recommend looking at our admissions website for the most up-to-date information on dates and deadlines. Speaking about those dates and deadlines, this is just another way to present those. Um, the application that we currently have open is that spring and summer 2024. The spring 2024 application deadline is November 1st, and students should have all of their materials submitted by November 13th. If a student is interested in summer of 2024, that application opened up on August 1st, and their application deadline is April 1st, with the materials deadline of April 22nd. And that fall 2024 application will open up on October 1st with an application deadline of July 1st and a materials deadline of July 15th. At UNF, there are some specialized or selective admissions. These programs do often have additional requirements and or additional deadlines that are going to be different from general admissions deadlines and requirements. So if you do have a student that is interested in one or multiple of the following programs, I definitely suggest um, not only yourself, but that student doing their research and looking up those additional dates and deadlines, as well as admissions requirements if they are interested in a particular program. Some programs may only have a certain number of seats available. Some of these programs are term, term specific. Some of these programs also require additional materials. So again, if you do have a student who is interested in any of these programs listed here on the slide, definitely be sure to research those additional deadlines and or those additional materials needed for that particular program's application process. This slide just gives you an idea of the specialized and selective admissions deadlines that are coming up. As I mentioned, some of these programs are term specific and will only admit to certain terms. Um, so definitely be sure, again, to do your research. We really encourage students to 
make sure that they know all of the dates and deadlines for their program, as well as the additional required admissions materials. Usually these are listed on the college's or the program's webpage through the UNF website. Just some tips that we, uh, this slide just has some tips that we often give out to students that are planning to transfer to UNF. The first one being, we really encourage them to work closely with their advisor at their current institution, as well as a UNF advisor for their particular program to make sure that they're taking the right courses and that the courses that they are currently taking are going to be applicable to their degree plan. Again, we also really encourage them to check out those additional program requirements or deadlines um, early to make sure that they are on top of everything in case they are applying to one of those specialized or selective admissions programs. And lastly, we usually always encourage transfer students to ap apply six months prior to the term that the start um, to the start of the term that they're interested in. After a transfer student has been admitted to UNF, these are some steps that they can take afterwards. So we really do encourage transfer students to apply to UNF scholarships. These scholarships are usually available for students that are starting in the summer or the fall term. These scholarships range in different amounts and they also vary um, in deadlines as well. So we definitely encourage those students to look on our scholarships website to see if there's anything that might be a good fit for those students. We also really encourage students to complete the FAFSA, that free application for federal student aid. Again, that'll probably open up sometime in early December, and we do have a priority deadline of January 15th. So we really encourage students to complete that FAFSA as soon as they can when it opens, so that way they are considered for our priority scholarship deadline of January 15th for any need-based grants and scholarships. We also really encourage students to register for transfer new student orientation and transfer new student orientation does have options to be virtual as well as in person. Those transfer orientations that are in person usually only last about half a day, but it's a really great way to get introduced to UNF and how things work at the university for students. And then we always really encourage students to check out the new student checklists that are available with on the new student orientation um, website. That checklist has a really great list of tasks to complete before students start at the university to make sure that they are on top of everything. That is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much for letting me spend some time with you to talk about the University of North Florida and the transfer process. If you or any students happen to have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to us e either by phone or by email. We would be more than happy to assist you and your students with the transfer process. Thank you so much and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you so much, Lauren, for your presentation. Feel free to reach out again to our Office of Admissions if you have any questions after the event today. Um, I will now go ahead and introduce Dr. Miwa Wynn. She is our Director of the Brooks College of Health Advising to be able to provide the Brooks College of Health presentation for today. Good morning, I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right, can everybody see the UNF website? All right, so uh, my name is Mira Wen from Brooks College of Health Advising Office. And within the Brooks College of Health, we have four bachelor's degree majors and 11 programs. And we break that into uh, two categories. Uh, one is a specialized admission program that Lauren touched on earlier. And then the other is uh, open access programs. So as you probably know, nursing programs, and kinesiology program, a specialized admission program that not only meeting UNF admission requirements, but also program admission requirements must be uh, satisfied for students to get in. And um, those who met the criteria, uh, there are limited number of seats available in the kinesiology and nursing program. So meeting that requirements alone will um, guarantee uh, admission into the program. Um, so for the nursing, we have different ways to get into the BSN programs. Uh, the first one is a freshman admit. This is strictly for the high school senior students to get in. And once get, students get into that freshman program, they do not have to go through another admission uh, process at the end of the sophomore year because 
uh, freshmen are admitted directly into the BSN program. And then this R and B assembly program is for students who completed AS in nursing program and AA degree at the state colleges to transfer to UNF to get a BSN degree. And this is an online one year program to accommodate the you know, students working as an RN already. And an accelerated nursing program is for a second bachelor degree seeking students. Um, so somebody with the bachelor degree in another field, you know, looking for a career change, uh, interested in the nursing field, then they go into this uh, full semester um, accelerated program. And this pre-licensure track is the junior entry, you know, the traditional AA transfer students to go into that uh, program at the junior level. And it's a five semester program uh, and then finish less than in the two years. So freshman admit program, because this is for the high school students. So we have a fall admission cycle only. We do not admit anybody into the uh, for spring and summer. And the online BSN, R and BSN bridge program, we start for spring and summer. Uh, same for the accelerated and uh, regular pre-licensure program. For those program, in the past, we only admitted uh, summer and fall semester, but starting this year, we are able to uh, admit students into those programs in the January start. And the two big changes are we no longer require T's and we no longer do an uh, interview process before uh, making the final decisions. So by removing those, uh, we do not have to wait till the application deadline passes to make the offer to students. So it's now a rolling admission process. So please encourage students to apply as soon as um, the UNF application available for the term they are interested in to transfer to UNF. Uh, and then kinesiology program, uh, that's another specialized admission program. And we admit about 90 students each fall. And that program lasts exactly two years. Students start in the fall semester and graduate two summer semesters later. And one thing about the specialized admission program, students must follow the block schedule. So they do not have the flexibility or freedom in making their own schedule um, because students are admitted together and go through the program together and graduate at the same time. And both programs are daytime, full-time programs and um, no part-time option is available except the um, online r and BSN uh, program. And other programs are open access programs, meaning that as long as students are admitted to UNF, they can pursue any of those health administration, health science with the interdisciplinary health studies or public health or nutrition and dietetics programs. One thing about the nutrition programs, um, they do have a block schedule. So please encourage students to start the program or transfer to UNF either in the summer or fall. Because if they transfer to UNF for the nutrition program in the spring, there is a few classes the students can take in the spring semester, but they still start the sequence in the fall and it takes five semesters. So they're gonna be at the UNF more than two years. So um, ideally students finish the AA, most of the prerequisites in the spring or summer term and then transfer to UNF uh, in the summer or fall semester for nutrition programs. Um, the health administration, public health, I uh, have a little bit of sequence, but it's not as strict as the nutrition degree. So students can transfer to UNF in the fall, spring and summer semester, even without completing all of the program prerequisites at the state colleges. So if they finish AA degree, but have like one program prerequisite left to do, they can go ahead and transfer to UNF and then start taking the major classes in health administration or public health, and then also the last prerequisite at the UNF in their first semester here. Or they can also start at the UNF, you know, taking major classes, but wanna finish the last prerequisite as a transient student back at your state college, they have an option to do so as well. 
Uh, interdisciplinary health study is a relatively new program. Um, let me open the program of study. Um, this has a um, this is a more student driven program, meaning that unlike the traditional curriculum that um, developed by the faculty uh, who are expert in the field, you know, students are provided with the list of the courses they have to take to finish the degree. Uh, this program, students create or develop their own program of study within the certain parameters. So um, there's a one class students must choose from here. They must have a five classes from here, but major electives and free electives are totally up to students. Um, so if one example of the student I have in this program is, um, he is interested in going to the law school after a bachelor's degree and is specialized in the healthcare lawsuit. So he didn't want to just have a criminal justice major. Uh, he wanted to have some kind of healthcare background or knowledge when they uh, he goes into the law school and eventually practice law. So he um, chose this interdisciplinary health study to have the healthcare knowledge and then incorporate the criminal justice type of um, major classes as his major electives and free electives um, to make this program fit his uh, unique goals. Um, another student also want to go into the healthcare information system type of field as a career after the bachelor's degree. And we just started the healthcare informatics program at the master degree level, but we do not offer that at the bachelor's degree level. So again, he uh, combined the healthcare classes with the computing major courses, and he created his own program of study. Um, and then another um, demand for this program is sometimes students start the pro one program at the UNF, but whatever the personal circumstances, they have to move away from Jacksonville and cannot take the in-person classes anymore, or their work schedule change. They have to work eight to five, Monday through Friday. Um, some students transition to this program and then choose online classes uh, for the remaining um, credit hours so they can still graduate from UNF with the degree instead of having to leave for another school that has more you know, online flexibility. So um, this is pretty unique, but um, there is a proposal process because students have to develop the program of study on their own. So that proposal process takes at least two to three weeks. Um, so if uh, you know students are interested in this major, uh, please have them apply to UNF as soon as possible and contact my office uh, as soon as they are admitted so that we can help them start the uh, this proposal process and then kind of uh, get them along um, on the process because there is a program orientation as well after the proposal is approved. Uh, so the program director can meet with the students and then they also have to do the meeting with advisors. So there's a quite process once they are admitted to the program and be able to register for classes. So um, the sooner, the better that they contact my office uh, to get the process started. Uh, so that's the interdisciplinary health studies. Um, oh, another thing about the nursing program, um, not um, only we are the met year round for spring and summer semester, but also we are the met more students each semester. Uh, until last year in 2022, we had admitted 84 students in summer and fall, but we are able to admit it. Uh, well, we admitted 160 students last fall. We had admitted uh, 100, uh, 110 students this spring 2024 start, and we expect to admit 100. 10 students again in the summer 2024, uh, thanks to the additional funding from the state to grow the BSN program. So the odds are better for students now, which is I like, which I like. <laughs> um, so please uh, encourage students to apply early uh, and then let them know that um, there are more seats to the, um, the junior entry program and um, the post back entry programs. <laughs> And then um, 
try and just going back to the nutrition program a little bit. So um, we had two tracks. One is to become a registered dietitian uh, as a career. Um, now the RD field requires a master degree to hold that licensure. So one way is to get a bachelor degree in um, didactic track and then go on to the master degree that incorporate the internship and then to be able to sit for the RD uh, licensure exam. Or we created a um, master degree in nutrition, this integrated future model. So in the past, master degree in nutrition, um, students had to have a bachelor degree in nutrition to go into. But this new master degree, we accept any students with the, any bachelor's degree who want to become a registered dietitian. Um, so that, um, you know, some students may start with the non-RD track nutrition degree, you know, community nutrition and food is less science heavy. Uh, it has more like a public health component, uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, their past to RD is non-existent. They can still, there is a way to become an RD, um, you know, if they are not sure which route to go uh, when they pick, uh, when they choose the bachelor degree. Um, because to become an RD, you're gonna need to have a master degree anyway. So um, if they choose actually any of the health degrees or even the psychology business degree, later on, they're interested in the RD career they can go into the um, integrated future model uh, in a company that require the master degree and didactic internship and to be eligible uh, for the RD licensure exam. Um, and then this is the new master degree in healthcare informatics. Um, if any students are interested in the healthcare informatics, uh, we do not offer that at the bachelor's degree but there's a um, master degree that students can get uh, through UNF. And um, additionally, we have, let me get to, we have an accelerated pathway for a couple of programs. Um, so they, um, the programs. So this accelerated pathway, uh, if students are accepted into this pathway, they can take graduate level courses as an undergraduate students, and then count that graduate level courses towards both bachelor's and master degree. And uh, we have some um, financial assistance to cover the difference between the graduate level course tuition and an undergraduate course tuition. Um, within the health, we have a BHA to MHA accelerated pathway. So uh, BHA students admitted into this pathway can take up to three master degree courses. So when they transition to the MHA, they have a fewer courses left to finish the MHA degree. And then we also have the similar pathway for the interdisciplinary health studies and then also kinesiology to athletic training um, degrees. Uh, those are pretty new. So if somebody interested in the MHA or uh, athletic training program, um, you know, please let them know that we have accelerated pathway, not only save them time for the master degree, but also save them some uh, money to complete the master degree. Right. And then I, uh, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer those as well. Uh, all right, I see the one question. All right, can high school student who graduate with the AA degree? Okay, thank you for asking me that question. Um, so the FIM program, uh, let me open up the curriculum. So, uh, so the 
simple question is no, the AA um, audit college students won't be eligible for FIN uh, because it has a four year sequence and it just uh, incorporate all the general education classes, BSN prerequisites. It just doesn't make sense for them to spend four years when they already have a, a AA degree. So um, students should apply for the junior entry, uh, the regular pre-licensure track. Um, so students apply. So, you know, high school student who graduate um, with an AA degree and high school diploma at the same time, uh, when they apply to UNF, they apply as a freshman and then, um, please have them contact the nursing office because um, so that the School of Nursing knows to consider that freshman applicants into the junior entry uh, program because they will be finishing the AA degree um, so that you know they are not missed uh, into the consideration now that we are having the rolling admission process. So the best email address to contact is... Mm -hmm. Nursing admissions. So Dr. Dibble uh, is assistant director for the nursing program admission. Actually, her email address is in here. So to me. Hey, Elena, if I type something in the chat, everybody can see it. Yes, they should be able okay. to see in the chat. All right. All right, so it's just a national admissions at the UNF.edu. So um, high school senior with an AA degree should apply to UNF as a freshman, select national as their intended major. And once they're accepted into the um, freshman status, then they can go ahead and contact national admissions at the UNF.edu. They're like, hey, I've been admitted to UNF as a freshman, but I'm actually going to finish the AA degree at the same time as a high school graduation. And then they know to um, consider the applicants for the junior entry. Um, you know, in addition to the AA degree, they must finish all of the A prerequisites by the end of the summer term um, to start the BSM program in uh, August. I don't know. Do I have to the 1040 or you want me to? Um, I can keep talking. Other information you'd like to share. It looks like we do not have any other questions in the question and answer feature as of currently. But again, feel free, any of our attendees, if you have any questions for the Brooks College of Health, any of the information discussed by Dr. Wynn, feel free to drop it in that Q&A feature at the bottom. Yeah, and then um, so two other things I'm proud of. Um, you know, within the Brooks College of Health, we have a very active student organizations for each major. So, um, you know, students have a support system to connect with the field while they are still, you know, enrolled at UNF, even before the internship semester. Um, you know, we have a great resource available to for them to start making the network in the field and building their resume. And the other thing is we have a robust uh, study abroad opportunities and the UNF offers a scholarship as well. Um, the nutrition uh, students go to the Italy every summer. Nursing takes students into the uh, usually England. Uh, or Austria between the spring and summer semesters and public health took students to the Indonesia last summer and they often go to the France and Switzerland uh, in the summer as well. Uh, health administration went to China and going to Japan um, this spring, this coming spring break as well. So, um, you know, great opportunity for that study abroad um, when they are at the UNF. All right. Alrighty, well, if we don't have any more questions, we can go ahead and transition into the next college presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wynn, for joining us nice today. To meet you. Bye. And again, if you all have any questions for the Brooks College of Health Advising um, in the future, we will also be showing their contact information at the end of the event today. Um, but now I would like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Jackson, the director of our Coggin College of Business Advising, to provide the Coggin presentation. Thank you. Of course. 
Good morning, everyone. It is nice to be here with you all virtually. Um, I don't have any updates to share, but for those of you who are maybe new in your positions, some of this information will be new information for you. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Give me one second. Hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. All right. Hopefully everyone can see the presentation. Hopefully, because I can't see you all right now because my presentation is up. And yes, okay, great. So welcome, I am Jennifer Jackson, the Director of Coggin Advising um, here at UNF. And I do have some information to share with you all. And of course, please feel free at the end of um, the presentation to ask any questions that you all may have. All right, so here um, is a list of the majors that we offer here in the College of Business for students. Um, we have nine majors. We also have minors for students um, to declare. There are a couple cool things about our curriculum here in Coggin. Um, it's easy for students to double major. It's easy for students to add a minor to their major or double major and double minor um, because some of our classes do course share. Students often think if they double major or if they add a minor that they will be here longer. That is not true. As long as they communicate with us early on in their career here to let us know what they're interested in, we will make sure we do the proper course planning to ensure that they get the courses that they need, that courses are able to course share where appropriate to ensure as best we can that they are not here any longer than they need to be, hopefully. Here are the prerequisites to all of our programs. These have been the prerequisites for years um, here at UNF. Students are not required to come to UNF with all the prerequisites to be admitted. We're not a limited access program um, or selective access. All of our programs students can be admitted to as long as they're admitted to UNF. We do encourage students um, to complete all the prerequisites before they come but they can be admitted without having the prerequisites. The benefit of completing the prerequisites before they come is that they will be able to start in all their upper level classes um, once they get here, but they can sprinkle in some upper level and some prereq classes if needed. Um, most of the upper level classes do require the prereqs that you see on the screen at some point. So having the prerequisites just allows students to have a smoother transition. But like I said, students can be admitted without having um, all their prerequisites. They can take those courses here at UNF. Um, also a benefit of transferring with their prerequisites, it minimized the potential of them incurring excess hours. Um, not sure how familiar you all may be with excess hours, um, but we try our best to minimize excess hours for students um, with proper course planning. So if they come with the prerequisites, that does help significantly. Um, a couple really cool things about Coggin, similar to what Miwa shared regarding study abroad, we do have a large study abroad program. We student students abroad um, over spring break or May break. We also send students abroad over the summer. Um, and we also send students abroad um, for a year. Um, our study abroad program does have funding attached to it. So there is scholarship funding to help students cover study abroad. Um, they can also use their normal financial aid, any grants, scholarships, loans, um, Florida prepaid, Bright Futures can also count towards study abroad. Um, study abroad also counts towards the student's major. So not only are they having an amazing experience, that experience is also satisfying a course or two, depending on how long students um, decide to stay abroad. Knowing that students want to study abroad um, early is helpful for us. So when we're doing course planning, we will be sure to make sure a student saves an elective, for example, 
or don't take a particular class because that class will be offered abroad in Argentina or Morocco. Um, so knowing what students want to do in advance is really helpful. Uh, but study abroad is an amazing opportunity for students. We often have students who will go abroad and also do an internship abroad. Um, and that's also an amazing opportunity for students. So that is something you can share with students as you meet with them. We also have a really robust career services center um, that does more, that center does more than resume critiques, right? They do more than help students prepare for, for interviews. Um, they offer um, mock interviews with companies out in the um, community. They help students search for internships, although internships um, aren't required. They do help students find internships. We often encourage students to pursue internships because one, it's real world experience. Two, students get paid for their internships. Um, and three, the internship can count towards their major um, as elective credit because every major has um, electives built into it. So the internship, study abroad, those opportunities can count within the student's major. Um, but career services also offer students major mixers. Um, so those are opportunities for students to engage with companies um, around their major. So we have accounting mixers, finance mixers, um, marketing, uh, what else, transportation and logistics. So those are awesome opportunities for students to engage with other students, but also companies in their, um, in their major field of study. And then of course, UNF offers every semester a week long career event, um, getting students prepared for the workforce or getting students prepared for internships. Um, and that's an awesome opportunity during that week for students to get engaged with employers. Um, so just a wrap up of why Coggin that you can share with your students. Um, our nine majors, 11 minors, we have two flagship programs, um, which are our international business program and our transportation and logistics program. Um, one cool thing that we have to offer for finance students is something called the Osprey Fi um, Financial Group um, or OFG. And that is an opportunity for finance students to manage a real fund here at UNF. The last time I checked, I think that fund was like $2 million of real money that students um, manage. And it's about 12 students who are admitted to the OFG program every year. Um, it's competitive to get in, but it's an amazing opportunity for those students. Um, we have, of course, again, a really robust study abroad programs. We have great student organizations around business. Women in business is a really popular one. Um, we have honors in the major. Um, our econ major, management, marketing, um, and international business and accounting. Um, those majors offer honors in the major. So students can not only graduate from UNF, but they can also graduate with honors out of those particular programs. Um, the information about honors in the major is on our website, but of course we share that information with students as well. And of course, lastly, the internship opportunities that I spoke about a little earlier. And here is our contact information. So you all are welcome to share this information with students. You're welcome to use it. The first email is our general email that we do check all day, every day. And that is also my personal email and that is the number to our office. So you are welcome to provide this contact information to students, but you're also welcome to use it. And that is it for me. All right, let's see if we have any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. You're welcome, Felita. Alrighty, again, just a reminder, feel free to use that Q&A feature at the bottom. If you do have any quick questions or um, any comments as well, you can feel free to use the chat on the right-hand side. 
Um, I think it looks like we do have one question um, from Brittany Janes. Their question is, what are the flagship programs? Um, we have two, international business and transportation and logistics. And for transportation and logistics, students often tell me, they're like, I don't want to learn to drive trucks. And we do not teach them to drive trucks. FSCJ does, but we do not. Alrighty, if we have any more questions, I'll give a moment for anybody to submit those either in the Q&A or in the chat. Okay. And then of course, if you have any questions that do come up after today, as Dr. Jackson displayed the contact information, we will also be displaying that at the very end of the event as well. Um, okay. It looks like we did have another question come in. Ruby Jackson asks, are new transfer students eligible to apply for the funding program or is there a wait period? That's a great question. Um, it depends on when they apply. So for example, Coggin scholarships open usually the first week of January. Um, and that's for the upcoming school year. And the deadline usually is in March, I believe. So depending on when students apply and when they are admitted, they may be in time to apply for the upcoming school year. We have over 75 scholarships for students um, to apply for those scholarships. Some scholarships are just the requirements is to be a business student. And then there are some scholarships that are major specific. Um, and students, of course, can apply for the ones that are just for business students because they will be business students, but they can also apply for the major specific scholarships if there are scholarships for their given major, but that's a good question. And then just for clarification as well, it looks like the fund management program they were mm. asking questions about. Oh, OFG. Um, the application for OFG usually opens in the spring for the upcoming school year. It is a two semester program. So if a student is admitted, the student will start the program in the fall and then they will finish the program in the spring. So it will be two courses that will count towards um, the student's finance electives. Good question. You're welcome. Thank you, Ruby, for that question. All right, we'll give another minute or so for anyone to submit any more questions we might have for the Coggin College of Business advising today. Okay. I'll just double check that chat. All righty. Well, if you don't have any more questions, we will go ahead and transition into our next college presentation. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for joining us today for the Coggin College of Business. We will now be going into our College of Arts and Sciences. We'll have a presentation from our College of Arts and Sciences advising. We'll have Josie Modernock with us here today, as well as Aaron Leedy. Um, and we will go ahead and start that transition very shortly.
my apologies, I was on mute. We have our College of Arts and Sciences here today. We have Erin Leedy and Josie Modernark from Advising to provide our College of Arts and Sciences presentation. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to them. Hello, just one moment as I am getting the PowerPoint up to share. I'll, Josie, you wanna introduce yourself while I'm getting this up and then I will as well. Absolutely, hello everyone. It's great to be with you today. Um, as Elena said, my name is Josie Modernock, and I currently advise in the College of Arts and Sciences, and the populations that I advise for are the um, biology students, chemistry, and behavioral neuroscience. And my name is Aaron Leedy. I'm the senior advisor for the College of Arts and Sciences. I currently advise for psychology, sociology. I'm also advising for criminal justice right now as we are searching for a new advisor. Uh, and I'm the new advisor for our Bachelor of General Studies, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end of this presentation. All right, I've got the slide up. Uh, can someone confirm for me? You can see it, Josie? Yes, we are all good. Perfect. All right. So what we're going to mainly be doing today is focusing on our different majors, which ones are limited access and the prereq requirements for them. Um, we thought this was the best way to disseminate the information and, and answer any questions you may have for students who are transferring in under one of the College of Arts and Sciences majors. We're not going to spend so much time talking about specifics for the majors and things like that, you know, internship requirements, those kinds of things, because we wanted to focus more on what they're going to need to know from you before they transfer so they can be as ready as possible. That being said, as we go through them and when we get to the end, if you have any specific questions, feel free to, to you know, write them down and we can address those too. So as you can see, there is a, there's a lot listed here, right? So the College of Arts and Sciences is quite large. We encompass um, a, a very large amount of the majors uh, and colleges that are available here at the University of North Florida. So we're going to be going over a lot and it is very diverse. So bear with us. And again, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Um, some of our majors are very open and easy to get into. If you're admitted to the institution, you're admitted into that major. Some, as I know a lot of you know, um, of these majors are limited access. You have to meet either specific requirements or you have to apply to the program interview and then be admitted as well. So we'll talk about that. For those ones specifically, it's great if the students know ahead of time. Um, so there's less surprises when they come here. Um, that being said, I've got to say, and Josie, I would assume you agree that usually when students are transferring from the state colleges, they're, they're fairly prepared. So um, it was really, really awesome to see how how they already know what to expect for the most part when they're transferring into some of these more complicated majors. Okay, so let's jump right in with bio and given that this is one of Josie's specialties, I'm gonna let her take over. All right, yes. So for our biology major, we have five different concentrations as you can see here. Um, the ecology evolution, coastal marine, coastal environmental, molecular and cell, and then biomedical sciences is, it, is on its own. Um, the selective admissions process for biology is you have to have general biology one and two with labs and general chemistry one and two with labs. In those four courses, you can't have more than two C's. So that is that is the selective admissions process for this. I tell students there's a lot of confusion with this. It seems that it's not a what if scenario. It's either a yes or a no. If you have at minimum two B's, two C's, you'll be admitted into the program in those four classes. Um, one thing that I want to um, clear up for our transfer students, um, a lot of them ask me, they say, okay, what if I don't have those four classes done? when I transfer in, can I be admitted into the program? Um, what we have is a provisional admittance. Um, if students have two of the four courses complete when they transfer into the program above 60 credits, um, they will be provisionally admitted into the program and they have three semesters to meet the requirements of all four courses. Um, if you have any questions on that, I can I can for sure clarify at the end. I know it can be confusing, um, but two of the four will get transfer students provisionally admitted into the program. Josie, are there repeat limits if they take like in like Gen Bio one four times to finally get that B? Is that going to cause them any issues? There is no set policy on repeat limits right now. Um, you know, I've talked to the um, chairs about this before, and they just say, you know, it's kind of a sign for you know this is the beginner level courses for what they're going to take. Um, but there is no policy on repeats right now. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much. 
So that takes us to neuroscience, which actually does have repeat limits. So they do not have the same limited access requirements that biology does. But because this is a STEM program that is fairly rigorous, um, a student is only allowed to repeat a class one time. So let me explain that a little bit better. So if they take Gen Bio 1 and they get a D, they take it again and get a C, they're fine. If they take it again and get a D and they need to take it a third time for that C, that would preclude them from the program. Um, now they can do this with more than one class, but once any uh, one of these prereqs needs to be repeated more than once, that, that does preclude them from it. So uh, just something for those students to be aware of. And that's simply because of the rigor of the program. They found that students that need that many repeats are gonna struggle. And then we have to worry about things like excess hours and financial aid, and they don't wanna get a student set up to get three quarters of the way through a degree, uh, just to have to change their major and then and then find something else there. Uh, anything specifically you wanted to add about neuroscience here, Josie, since I know you advise for this major as well? No, I think you hit it all there. Wonderful. And so that brings us to chemistry. Chemistry is a little more flexible, definitely still a difficult major, um, but they do not have the same limitations that we will see with the, the biology and the neuroscience. Um, that being said, students obviously need to be very prepared for, for um, a fairly robust um, set of courses. Um, I will take the time to say as well, students that want to go pre-med, looking at med school, these are the three main majors that we see for those students. So that'd be the biology, the neuroscience, and the chemistry. Every now and then we might see someone that, that goes a physics track for that, but these are the three main that we see. So there are lots of options there. And of course, we always recommend students talk to Dr. Sots Potter, who is our pre-med director, who is a wonderful resource as well. So you can let your students know who are transferring here, that we have... Um, individuals in place to help them as they're trying to take those next steps to prepare for medical school. Um, as you can see, there are some specific concentrations here, but again, students can reach out to specific advisors for that. There's really not a lot you have to worry about there, um, other than, as you see here, the calc-based physics. So if they are going to be taking physics ahead of time, um, they require the calc-based physics. The algebra-based won't satisfy that requirement. And so we're going to transition away from STEM a little bit into communication. So we have a lot of different concentrations here. Uh, as with the other majors we've talked about, we don't have the same limitations. You know, you're admitted to the university, you can pursue one of these tracks in communication. Uh, we do have a couple of classes that are kind of nice to be done ahead of time. Uh, we have stats for business listed there, but of course that's the STA 2023, the same stats that you would see coming over from the, the state institutions. Uh, nice to have fundamentals of speech taken care of as well. So if they're looking to get a little bit ahead when they're coming in, uh, those are two great classes that they can take for their general education requirements. Um, lots of neat internship opportunities within these, but again, if students are interested, you can reach them out, uh, not so much things that, that you have to worry about with them when you're meeting with them at this point. Uh, criminal justice is another one that's a very easy transition. No surprises here. I believe if you go online to our website and you look at the prereqs, it doesn't actually list statistics as a prereq, but it is. They need to have the SDA, you know, 2023 here. You know, we have a couple of statistics options. We have 2014 here as well. They do need statistics done so they can take the research methodology class for criminal justice. Um, we do also allow intro to criminal justice, though it's a lower level class at the state institutions um, and it's an upper level class here at the university, they will allow this class to transfer directly into the major. So this will satisfy one of the major requirements. It is the only one that does that though. So if you've got a student who wants to do criminal justice and they want to take extra CJ classes, you know, with y'all, I've seen students come in with three, four, five even, right? Um, this is the only one that'll come in. Of course, the other ones can still give them a nice foundation if that's what they're interested in though. Right. English has a couple of specific tracks here that they can start working on if these classes are offered by your institution. Uh, and you can see them specifically here. We will have this PowerPoint slide provided so you can use it as a reference. Uh, but as you see here, there's a couple of different paths they can go down uh, that they need for their survey requirement. And, and either one of these is fine and they can start working on those early as well. Uh, as we transition to art and design, things do get a little more complicated here. Some of our art programs are limited access. Um, the main one that comes to mind, obviously, is our graphic design here. So we do have a lot of different majors, as you can see at the top here, the ceramics, the graphic design, painting, drawing, printmaking, photography, and sculpture. But the graphic design specifically, I don't know what happened there, but the graphic design specifically um, is limited access. So you can see the requirements here. I know most, if not all, those are available at 
um, at the state institutions. Um, but just because they have them doesn't mean that they are necessarily admitted. If you've got a student interested in graphic design specifically, I would recommend you have them reach out to the graphic design advisor here a little bit earlier, just so we can make sure they're kind of ahead of the game on that. There's, we got a, a couple of majors like that. This social worker ones where even if they still got a semester, maybe two semesters left with you, it might not be a bad idea to start to make those connections early just because of the requirements for getting in. That takes me to news, uh, music. Music education does require the GK test, the same GK test that I'm sure you've heard about or will hear about from education. Um, and, and that's just based on one of the requirements for it. Uh, there are also proficiency exams they will take uh, once they're here. Um, I always like interacting with the music education students here because they seem to be, you know, like, experts in like 30 different instruments to come in and, and show all the different things that they know um, very broad, but they, they definitely need to come in expecting to have to meet some of the same requirements that they would if they were going one of the education majors, um, music technology and production. So here, you know, they start to, to have, you know, their specific areas of expertise and they do have to audition within those areas. So if you've got anyone interested in music tech and production, um, I would recommend giving them that email below and having them also reach out, you know, I would say before they apply to the institution, just so there's no surprises there, so they know what to expect. So interdisciplinary studies. So interdisciplinary studies is our major where you can build your own major. So a lot of times we'll have people coming in looking for something like hospitality management, or sometimes we'll have individuals coming in looking for communication disorders because they want to go on and be a speech language pathologist later on. Now there are other options for those students too. They can always do bridge programs, but we, we, we get these students some of these majors we just don't offer and IDS is a great way for them to build that. Now, Historically, students used IDS for one of two reasons. Uh, one was to build a theme-based major that they were interested in, uh, and the other was to help students who had accomplished um, a whole lot of credits in a whole lot of areas and try to find a way to, to pull them together into something that, that would allow them to graduate with their bachelor's degree. IDS wasn't really designed for that, but it was helping to meet the needs of those students. That being said, we don't have a slide on this because it's not really a major that we we are promoting as far as one of the ones that students usually transfer and wanting to do, but we do have a, a Bachelor of General Studies at BGS. So if you've got a student that's just got a bunch of credits now, again, they still need to meet the 120 hour, 48 hour at the upper level requirements. And so they're probably not coming over from y'all with a bunch of upper level credits. But if you do have a student who's just, man, I just want a degree. The general studies can be a great option for them. And the nice thing is it's kind of allowed interdisciplinary studies to, to be its own thing and be what it was designed to be, right? So students can build these programs. They can meet with the director. They get to pick their own title and the, the focus and, and the track that they're going to be going down, pulling in classes from different majors. Um, it does require some specific things. It requires a minor, stuff like that. But those are things that you don't really have to worry about. But if you've got a student, let's say a student, especially for those of y'all, you know, here in, in Jacksonville, the Jacksonville area, if you've got a student who, who doesn't have the option to go elsewhere and is, is knows they're going to UNF, but we don't offer the major they're looking for, this is a great option for them to still meet those needs. International studies has some specific requirements for it that are all pretty darn cool, if you ask me. So it does require a study abroad. So we work very closely with the study abroad um, department here, as well as, as um, businesses study abroad. Um, they are, there are a couple of specific language requirements, as you can see here, they can start working on those ahead of time. Uh, if you have INR 2002, I don't know if that's a class beyond UNF. Um, this is, no, no, I believe that's something just specific here. Uh, and again, if we have a question about that, we can address that there at the end. But anyone interested in international studies specifically, I would have them start focusing on, on one of those language requirements that, that is offered at your institution. So for math and stats, you can see we have these three below courses. The preferred COP uh, 2220 are the only COP classes um, that are allowed to come into the pre rec area for a math and stats student. So not a lot you have to worry about there for math and stats students. Um, again, pretty, this one's pretty straightforward. Which allows us to transfer into physics. So 
Um, and Josie, feel free if there's anything specific you want to jump in on physics as well. So all the majors that are starting here take the PHY 1024 Intro to Physics for new majors. Uh, and then, of course, they'll take the, um, the Intro to Physics that's required for them to go on and take Physics 1 that is required as a prereq, the PHY um, 1020. It used to be a long time ago, and this is the same for, for chemistry as well, that if students had the intro class in high school, that they could go right into Physics 1 and right into Chem 1. Uh, and again, Josie, feel free to jump in on here. That's not the case anymore. Of course, um, hmm. Should we have mentioned now now that I've moved way past chemistry, should we have mentioned the chem one and the tune up aspect of that? Or do you think that's not necessary? Um, I can mention it. I, I can mention that. Um, like Aaron has said, the introduction to physics is definitely um, a requirement. The chair really won't let students pass it. So it seems to be a shock to a lot of students that we have. Um, because I know other institutions don't always require that. So just know that if they're planning to take physics one here, they do have to take the introduction to physics course and there's really no way around that. Um, and as Aaron was mentioning for our chemistry majors um, and those that have to take chemistry one as part of their degree, which is a lot of our degrees here, um, they, um, we have they do require an intro to chem chemistry. However, students are able to get around that. Um, once they register for chemistry, general chemistry, they get put into a Canvas course to take an Alex placement. Um, if they get 85% through that placement exam, um, they can bypass intro to chem and just be straight into general chemistry one. So it is um, easy for students to get past the intro to chemistry part, um, but not intro to physics. Wonderful. Anything else that you think we should add here on physics or chemistry before I die? We're doing these kind of in alphabetical order, but that's allowed me to jump back and forth from STEM back into yeah, social yeah. sciences. Yeah, there is one more thing I will add. Um, I think students, I see this a lot as biology. Um, students are trying to get their um, prereq courses that they need for med school, dental school, vet school, whatever that may be. Um, we are seeing now that a lot of um, these pre-professional schools are requiring calc-based physics over algebraic-based physics. Um, and so that's just something for your students to look at early on um, what physics is required if they're planning to go to a pre-professional school. It's worth them even reaching out. Um, we just found out programs, if they're even like an anesthesiologist assistant program, they're requiring calc-based physics over algebraic. So if students have already gone and taken algebra-based physics, they had to go back and take the calc-based version for, for the schools they really want to get into. So just something to look at, look into. Yeah, and I know that can be overwhelming for students to think, what do you mean? I'm already looking at the requirements for my grad program. I'm just applying to, you know, to my junior senior program. Um, but it's a good point. So you have had had students go and then retake the calc base, even though they had the algebra based. Good to know. Absolutely. All right. So transitioning back to social sciences. So we have uh, political science here. The intro to AMGov uh, transfers in very nicely. Um, and you can see the other, the choose one that are listed there. I know it says strongly encourage statistics. I would more strongly encourage statistics than strongly encourage statistics, right? There is a two-part research methodology requirement for political science. And so, yeah, they're going to want to do statistics. And of course, they can take those as one of their two, um, the two uh, Gordon math requirements. Uh, here's another good point for me to talk about our other um, professional director, Dr. Adrian Lerner, is our pre-law director. So we talked about our pre-med director. Uh, Dr. Lerner is the person anyone who wanted to go to law school or something similar to that would reach out to. And obviously, they don't have to major in political science. A lot of times, she will meet with them and recommend other majors. Obviously, the majors that they're looking for are ones that give them strong writing skills, uh, critical thinking skills, those kinds of things. But they really want to see uh, strong writing from these individuals. So... Again, Dr. Lerner would be a good person. If you just know you got a student that wants to go to law school, they could definitely reach out to her uh, as they're planning on transitioning here. They don't have to wait until they're a student here. So something to think about there. All right, so psychology. We have four different majors in psychology, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, and we do have a child concentration in both. The nice thing is that the prereqs are the same for all of them. And, and really the first semester they're here, the classes are the same. So we can allow them to explore BA, BS once they're here. That's not a big deal. What we do want them to do, though, is get that intro to psychology or general psychology done, um, as well as some sort of bio requirement. Now, we have a lot of 
flexibility in this bio requirement. Um, students can take Gen Bio 1, uh, they can take 1010, they can take 105, they can also take anatomy. Anatomy 1 will satisfy this requirement too. Um, human biology will satisfy this requirement. The things that want, they wanted to go over, over animal cell structure and, and those aspects. So any type of of botany or any any to environmental biology won't usually satisfy this requirement, but but again, A and P one, BSC ten 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 five, any of those are fine, and they do require statistics here as well. There's a a decently extensive uh, research methodology component to all four of the psychology degrees, and so STA twenty twenty three uh, is perfect for this. So uh, you can see there's some things in here about the research here, but again. If you have specific questions about that, you can reach out to us directly or have the students. Uh, that takes us to social work. So social work is the other big one that that we kind of need students to know ahead of time if they're wanting to go down this route because there's some prep that's involved. Now, that being said, uh, I've been meeting with the director of the social work department here, and they're trying to make this transition a little smoother on students. Uh, but there are some things that they need to know. So for a student to start in the social work program, they have to apply to the social work program and be accepted to the social work program in addition to being accepted to the University of North Florida. Those applications are only for the fall. They interview in the spring. So any applications from the prior year up until February, they stop accepting applications in February. They interview February and March, and then they will accept their cohort for the fall semester of, of that same year. So it really is set up a lot like, like what you would expect a cohort-based graduate program to be set up. I mean, they do full interviews, and everything. Before they start the program, they also need to have the specific prereqs done, which now I realize don't look like they are listed on here. All right, I can provide that. So students are going to need, let me, forgive me why I do this off the top of my head. They need um, intro to psychology, American government, macro or microeconomics, and I'm missing at least one. Oh my goodness, I can't believe that's not here on this sheet. Um, I'll tell you what, this is going to be weird, but I'm going to do it. Forgive me here. Here's the requirement for BSW. And look, the prereqs aren't listed on there either. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Josie, could you do me a favor? While I'm... Um, I'll go and talk about sociology and then maybe we can come back and list those specifics because I want to make sure that people know them. If you go on to store catalog, we can see yep. the specific ones. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we'll come back and talk about the rest of sociology here in a moment. I can't believe that's not there. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we'll, we'll talk about sociology. So sociology, like psychology and some of our other um, social sciences, again, once you're accepted to the institution, it's an easy easy start right in sociology. They do need to have statistics. Statistics is a prereq for the research methodology courses they'll be taking. Uh, it's also a require that they have two lower level sociology classes. Now, we have these three listed here, the intro to sociology, social problems, and sex, race, and class. If you have other lower level sociology classes there, we have been able to see those transfer in. So any two uh, one or 2,000 level classes that start with an SY, SYG, SYO, SYP, any of those will satisfy that prereq area there. If they take more than two, those lower level ones aren't going to be counting in the elective area. Same, or I'm sorry, major elective area. Uh, same thing with psychology. Sometimes we'll see students come in and they'll have, they'll have taken every single psychology class you have because they just love it, right? But only one of those will count in the prereq area. The others are just free electives. They, they don't equate to the upper level. Um, Josie, did that give us time to go back and talk about the specifics here? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So the prereqs for the social um, work program before prior to being admitted is intro to American government, one biology course. So whether that once again is 1005C or Gen Bio 1010C or even anatomy and physiology, um, introduction to psych, introduction to sociology. I believe that might have been the one we're missing. And then one of the economics classes, macro or micro. I did. I missed the intro to sociology and I missed the, the bio. So that's perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice that statistics isn't a requirement and it's not. Statistics is not a prereq requirement for social work, but it is a prereq requirement for an MSW. So again, if you've got a student there early on and they're like, social work is my future, I'm going to go get a, a BSW than an MSW, go ahead and put them in that statistics because otherwise they're going to have to come back and take stats after they graduate with their bachelor's degree. 
Um, one nice thing about the social work program here is once you've been accepted into it, and if you're successful in it, there's a really good chance that you will then be able to be admitted to an accelerated master's program. So the social work accelerated master's, the MSW, is only another year. They start in the summer. They start a semester earlier than the rest of their cohort, but then they just take one year and then they got their MSW as opposed to the two-year program. So that can be really beneficial for students to do that, but they are only eligible for the accelerated program if they are... Um, if they have a bachelor's degree in social work. I talked to a couple of advisors at FCJ. I don't know if you guys are on here uh, and we were talking about this. Yes, if they are applying to our MSW, they can have a BSW from another institution and still be eligible for the accelerated. It just does have to be a BSW. Uh, that being said, students can get into MSW's master's of social work with sociology degrees, psychology degrees, and, and other options there too, but we're not talking about grad school right now. All right, so we talked about sociology and those requirements. Anthropology, the prereq area, they just require the um, yeah two lower level A and T classes to count there in the prereq. So if you have those offerings, it can give them a little bit ahead of schedule. Stats isn't a bad idea for anthropology, just like with any of the other social sciences. But if you're you're looking to get them set up, two lower levels are great. We talked about international studies. We do also have two specific language majors here, so. Uh, Spanish and French are the two options, and they can come in, obviously, having Spanish and French uh, language courses ahead of time. If they are native speakers or if they are just very proficient, we do have placement exams that will help them when they're coming in, but they can absolutely get credits knocked out ahead of time. Um, of course, you know, there's CLEP credits and things like that, too. Things that aren't transferring in. Every now and then, we'll have a student come in, and they'll be like, oh, I, I took a language placement test at my previous institution. Um, if they... if, if Y'all have granted retroactive credit. Those those come in. But as far as just a placement test that placed them into, you know, intermediate Spanish two, that they would have to redo the placement test here um, unless unless anything like that has changed, which I don't believe it has. Um, again, Spanish and French, just like a majority of other majors, are not limited access. So once you're admitted, you're you're good to start pursuing these majors. One thing, Erin, I want to add there for Spanish, I know there is one certificate programs, um, Spanish for professions, um, that I see some of my biology chemistry students add on as a certificate that's been that they're really pushing in the program as well, too. That's cool. Yeah, we didn't really get to talk about certificates or minors or anything like that. General information that I'm, I'm sure you all know, any Bachelor of Arts student coming in does require a minor and additional foreign language. So if you do, if you've got a student you know is coming into a Bachelor of Art program and they already have the two years in high school, but they like language, they could take two years with you and that would satisfy the BA foreign language requirement here um, as well. So just something to think about there. All right, that does bring us to our last major and just over 20 minutes. So Josie, we only ran over by like two minutes. It was pretty good. Um, but I do see we have some questions coming in as well. So let me look here. And feel free to throw more in there. So how oh, does a student uh, initiate an IDS degree creation as a proposal? It is. Okay, so we'll start there and I'll work my way through here. So for interdisciplinary studies, it's all online now. So what they would do is they would come in interested and we would have them meet with their interdisciplinary studies advisor. They would talk about the requirements and then they get set up for a pre-proposal. The IDS advisor um, sends them a link where they can go in and they'll actually pull in all the classes that they think would fit into this theme. So let's say, for example, I want to do a theme in hospitality. Well, I might take a couple of classes in sociology, but a couple of classes in business and maybe nutrition class. I mean, who knows, right? And so they would list all those classes. And then there's some questions below it. You know, why, what is your general theme? Why have you picked this theme? How will this help you in, in the future? And so they would list all those things. Once they're done, they submit their proposal. It gets looked over by the advisor and then sent to the IDS director who will either give feedback about how, you know, this doesn't encompass everything it needs to, or maybe they've pulled in too many lower level classes, or maybe it's too similar to a degree we already have, but there'll, there'll be a little bit of back and forth between the uh, the advisor, the student, and the director. And then once it gets approved, we we build it within degree works and the student's all set. Uh, if you have any other questions about uh, IDS there, um, feel, feel free to to throw them in after and and i can expand upon that but yeah they reach out to us and then we we help them build it with the director so i have a question regarding sociology must the two minimum soig prereqs 
um, be from the list of three specific courses. Oh, okay. I think I already addressed that after you posted it. Uh, no, it, it doesn't. We can go in and pull in other lower level SYG classes if you offer different ones at your institution. They may not come in automatically, but they're fine with us pulling in different ones. It's a good question. Are transfer students eligible to join accelerated bachelor's to master's degrees? Yes, they absolutely are. So I'll pick psychology, for example. Josie, you can talk about biology if you want to, right? So psychology has an accelerated BS to MS. Um, for that, your requirement, you've got to get involved with, with research and start to find connections with faculty pretty early on. So if I have a student that's interested in this, and, and I get a lot of questions from transfer students coming in with their AA, I have them start to reach out to faculty almost immediately. I have them take research classes early on because what we do for, at least for psychology, is the major elective area basically gets double counted. We count the first semester of their graduate classes as their, all of their major electives. But if they come in and they just start taking, you know, psych of women and intro to counseling and things like that, they're going to eat up that area um, as well. So, um, Josie, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so same here. It's really similar for our um, accelerated biology um, degree, BS to MS. Students need to apply in their junior year status, but it's, I think the application is in March. So there's definitely time for them to do that. The only thing that we want students is the same thing, those electives, we want them taking it at the 5,000, 6,000 level. So we just want to catch it early on that they're not taking it at, at the 3,000, 4,000 level. So yes, definitely able to do it as a transfer. And Elena, did you want to comment on this as well? Um, No, I didn't have any other additional information, but thank you. Okay, I just saw, okay, perfect. Um, so for students who went to high school in a foreign country and have received a foreign language waiver for their AA degree, mm -hmm. uh, will UNIF accept the ACTFL, the foreign language requirement, or do you provide a foreign language waiver for non-English speakers? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's a good question. What we've been doing at this point, and Josie, jump in if, you, if you've got more, Usually when a student comes in who's a native speaker at another institution, we send them to the foreign language department here. They meet with the chair, they demonstrate that proficiency, and then we use that to meet the foreign language requirements. Again, remember, there are two foreign language requirements here. There's the general state foreign language requirement that you're addressing. There's also, and so if they've come over with their AA, that area is probably met. If they are a Bachelor of Arts student, though, the foreign language department typically likes them to do a foreign culture option if they are proficient in the foreign language, though. So what I mean by that is if they're coming in and they're a native speaker, the state foreign language is usually already met and that's not a problem. They will waive the foreign language requirement for the Bachelor of Arts degree, but require them to take the two anthropology foreign culture classes instead. Um, Josie, anything on that you wanted to? No. OK, perfect. So. Um, I, I, I'll try to do a little bit of research and see if I can get a little more solid of an answer because we, we do sometimes that area gets a little, a little wonky, but usually again, when they're coming in with their AA, because at that point they've met the foreign language requirement for the AA, it satisfies the state requirement here too. All right, Josie, I don't know if you can see these. So if a student transfers in PHY uh, 2048 or 2053, are they required to still take the introduction to physics or is it waived? Yeah, so I am able to see them. Uh, that would be waived then. If they already have one of them done and they're just moving on to physics two at that point, they they do not have to take intro to physics. Wonderful. Um, do you have a mathematics major that, uh, a mathematics bachelor's degree that is done completely online? Josie, do you know the answer to this question? I don't believe it is online, a hundred percent online, no. We are working, I'm working with online programs specifically to, to have more information on what's directly available online. So that's one thing I know the institution is working very strongly on. That being said, within the College of Arts and Sciences, the only one I really know you can do completely online is criminal justice. Uh, it's not an online program, but you can do it completely online. We just have to sometimes get a little creative with your pre-internship and internship, mainly the internship. All the other majors specifically are not online programs. That being said, more and more of them since COVID have kind of remained this way, have more online options. Like psychology is not an online program, but it is possible to get that degree completely online as well. So um, I like your question there. I'll, I'll do a little bit more to try to get some more robust, robust answers as far as online programs specifically, but I'm not aware of one. And no, Josie, you're not either of one specifically for mathematics. 
Wonderful. Well, that has brought us to the end of all of our questions there. And we really appreciate y'all taking the time with us here to be able to go over such a large amount of information. All righty. Thank you so much, Aaron and Josie, for joining us today to answer all of those questions and prevent all the information in regards to the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, we will now be moving on to our next college presentation. We will be having for our College of Computing, Engineering, and Construction, Jamie Oliver, to present information in regards to that college. That college. Hi, everyone. How are you? So let me go ahead and share my screen. Let me just delete some tabs here. I'm the type of person that has 925,000 screens. Tabs open all the time. So hopefully you can see um, on my first screen. So basically um, the first overview I'd like to share. So we have programs in our School of Computing, which is computer science, which most people and most students really understand, which is more of our hardware major. So a lot of those students are really interested in hardware development. It is very much the science side of computing. So if you have students who are talking about game development, app development, software, um, all of those different soft side of computing, those are going to be our other majors. So our computer science program is the hardest one. Um, it does require the regular calculus, physics, um, one and two, calc one and two, and some additional sciences. So when you're talking to students, and I know we've been out to the various state colleges recently and please feel free to always reach out to us, but we really like to let students know on the front end, the differences between the majors. So with our information science and information systems majors, those are more of our um, soft side of computing. So our game development, our software development, our app development, um, and all of those um, have some business courses entwined in them because we really want students to be able to understand and communicate with the business side operations of different companies. So you are not only the person who understands all the backend computing terminology and, and production, but you're also being able to talk about how much it costs, the economics to it, um, the return on investment, all of those different components as well. So you're able to really communicate that. Our fourth major is information technology, and this is kind of a misnomer. This is actually a cyber defense, cybersecurity program. So these students are really learning intrusion detection, um, AI software, um, a lot of the courses that are really working with companies and educational systems um, and the federal government to look at phishing attacks and different types of malware and all of those different types of things. So if you have a student who is really looking into cybersecurity or cyber defense, I highly encourage them to go into our information technology program. And then the last one is our data science. And so this is probably our newest major, um, but it is the one that probably has the highest amount of students that are hired right out of it because data science is really looking at data tracking, right? So again, all different types of companies are looking at the different types of data, right? So, and the software for tracking. So right now my phone is sitting on my desk and it is listening to me talk about all these different things. So I will start to get ads. That's data science, right? Really looking at what is my search history? How do I look at things? Where do I go? How long do I do them? Um, statistics is a huge one. So again, if you're talking to students who love statistics and kind of love analyzing data and things like that, our data science major is definitely going to be one of them. Um, so the biggest thing I know with all of our computing majors is our selective admission. And so just on our CCEC page, if you come down to the School of Computing, selective admission is right there. Um, it has all of the information, but for all of our transfer students, I tell them to scroll down to the bottom and looking at the different requirements. And really the biggest difference is the math. So they all require programming one. And I know not everyone has COP 2220, um, but the Dean and I have gone through 
22 of our state colleges and pulled out the courses that are equivalent to our COP 2220. Um, if you have questions about what classes at your school um, satisfy this requirement, please feel free to email me. My email is j.oliver, O-L-I-V-E-R, at unf.edu. I'm happy to share that information with you. I don't have it up on my screen right now because it's really not in a pretty format. Um, but I have been communicating with a lot of students. I've had like four or five of them from uh, Miami-Dade this week. So um, if anybody's here from Miami-Dade, that's awesome. Your students are reaching out um, and having those questions answered. So programming one, which is that first class, that's a C plus in Java class. Um, and then the calculus. So for computer science and data science, we need that heavy calculus. And then for the other three programs, we do require the business calculus. So if you're working with students, these are the classes that they have to have on their transcript prior to being admitted. So in our applications process, any student coming in with an AA or over 60 credits um, comes to the college and we review them for these specific courses. Um, when they are denied, I am sending a communications like, hey, you're missing these selective admission courses. So any type of information that you can give them on the front end is fabulous. Um, again, I am happy to talk to any of you all or any students at any point in time in their application process. A lot of students will be taking these classes within the semester that they're applying for right before. So I have a lot of students who have applied for the spring semester who are currently in some of these classes in the fall. I communicate with them to make sure that they have will be submitting me an unofficial transcript um, just because of timing the way that classes end in the fall and begin in the spring semester to show that they have passed those classes so they can be admitted. A lot of times, especially when it comes to spring and summer admission, it is a quick turnaround. So I do make sure that uh, those students are in communication with me to make sure that they have all of those emails and screenshots and everything like that so we can get them admitted and then they send those final transcripts afterwards. So all of our information for all of our student resources, a lot of times uh, students are always reaching out about, you know, computers and things like that. All of our information is on this website. We have done a really um, thorough look at our website to say what exactly is missing, what do our students need? And so please feel free if you have additional questions or you're like, hey, I can't find this, always let us know. Um, you know, I try to get back to people as soon as possible. Um, so hopefully you have been able to get those questions answered for you. So then moving on to our School of Engineering. So again, we have four engineering majors. Um, we have advanced manufacturing, which again is one of our newest majors. That is really looking at all like the components from the particles to the end product. So a lot of times people are like, well, what does that mean? Um, other schools call it industrial engineering. So we're looking at all the pieces of a product. And so this is not the old factories um, that have no air conditioning or anything like that. These are actually um, production organizations that are super clean, probably cleaner than the office that I'm sitting in right now. So contact lenses is a big thing, Bausch & Laum. Uh, brought a manufacturing facility to Jacksonville last year, and they have been looking for quality assurance, um, quality control folks. That is our um, advanced manufacturing students. And knowing how to look at the machines, look at the, you know, if something breaks down, like what is going on with them. So one of our professors, Stephen Stagon, has really taken a big um, part of working with this major, really looking at how how is this manufacturing kind of a little bit different than all of our other ones? So it has a lot of our mechanical engineering courses, but really kind of focuses on that um, manufacturing piece. So with our civil engineering major, obviously bridges, roads, structures, um, many of our students who are interested in civil engineering, who don't love that math and science, I would highly encourage them to look at our building construction management program that I'll talk about in a minute. But our civil engineering program really is looking at all of those different components of geotechnical, um, geomatics, um, 
we have some courses in coastal and marine, you know, erosion. Obviously, where we are, we have a lot of those issues that are facing, you know, not even not just Northeast Florida, but all of Florida. And so a lot of that beach erosion, we have a lot of faculty that are looking into the coastal environments as well. And so our next major is electrical engineering. And so a lot of our students are really looking into digital circuits, different types of circuits, whether it's circuits within um, buildings or circuits within, you know, cars or toys. You know, we have a lot of students who are really looking to work for toy manufacturers um, our career fair is actually happening right now, um, and we actually have Universal uh, Studios Creative is at our career fair, and they're looking for our electrical engineering students because of all the different rides that they have at the theme parks right now um, are looking for electrical engineers because obviously there's a lot of different components when it comes into making sure the safety um, and the different electrical components of all of those different types of rides. They have a lot of simulation rides if you haven't been to uh, Universal Studios recently, but that is their number one hire is electrical engineering students. Um, so again, you can kind of take an electrical engineering degree in, in many different facets. And then our last undergraduate degree in engineering is our mechanical engineering. And so this major is very broad, kind of encompasses a lot of different facets. So you're taking classes in thermodynamics, you're taking classes in actual regular dynamics. Um, the great thing is you kind of dabble in different areas of mechanical engineering um, to kind of have this very broad degree that comes out um, at the end. You have a two semester senior design project. Um, so all of our engineering majors have this two semester senior design, and they're actually working with a company that is having an issue right now. And so you are paired with, in your class, multiple different majors. There's a group of five students that is working with a company and their representatives throughout the entire year. And at the end of that year, you are, as a student group, presenting your findings to faculty, to staff, to other students, and to all of our industry partners in the spring semester. So the biggest thing I will say with our engineering majors is they are very structured. A lot of our students will come in and they have to stay on the specific path. These are probably one of the hardest majors I've ever come across in my higher education experience because if you get off track with one class, you're put off an entire year. Um, so we have created these pathways sheets. Um, we handed them out like at the transfer fairs the past couple of weeks to really show that even with your AA, you will be in an engineering program for an additional three years just because of the way the structure of the program. So these majors are also selective admission. And so again, the selective admission is right there on the side. And you will see for all four of our majors, Calc 1, Calc Based Physics 1, and chemistry are required for admission. Um, the caveat there is the chemistry lab is not required for the electrical engineering major. Many schools have that combined into their chem 1024, or excuse me, chem 2045 or 1045. Um, and so that is perfectly fine. Students who do have those, you know, separated out, that's perfectly fine as well. We just like to tell students that if you're going into electrical engineering and you do not have that, left, that lab component, that's perfectly fine. And then our last department is our construction management program. And so the one thing I'd like to say about our construction management program, it, it, it has a 100% job placement. Um, and not job placement through UNF, job placement through our industry partners. So again, I mentioned our career fair that's happening right now. We have 174 employers that are there. There are 100 construction management firms that are looking to hire our students there today. So our construction management program is the only one that is an open access program through um, CCEC, through our you know, College of Computing, Engineering, and Construction. These courses right here that are our prereqs, they are not required to be completed prior to coming into UNF, but we always encourage you to have those, right? Because these are all one in 2000 level classes that most state colleges have, with the exception of the drawing, the materials, and the structures, um, and the layout course. Everything else can be completed at the state college level. Now, I know there are some schools that do have construction drawing and construction materials, 
And by all means, please encourage your students to take those as part of their electives, as part of their AA. Um, but we do not penalize any students. Like I said, these are open access programs. So all of these courses are the ones that are available to you to take before you come to UNF. So the one thing that I will add for a lot of the students that are transferring in is we are one of the most active and industry engaged colleges on this campus. We not only have, you know, like everyone else, career fairs every single semester, but we have employers come into all of our classes pretty frequently. Um, there is a intro to CCEC class that is offered for freshmen and for semester transfer students that is sponsored by industry. Um, and each week they come in and really talk about the different types of jobs and internships that they are looking for. I will also say that our construction management program is the only one that has a internship required. So you have the availability to um, do an internship for a requirement and then kind of see what fits you and what doesn't fit you with internships. And that's the biggest thing I always tell students is, you know, an internship is not just to find what you like. It's also to find what you don't like. Um, so I know I talk fast. Um, so hopefully that answered everyone's questions. I will double check in the chat um, to see if there is anything additional. It doesn't look like that, but if there's any additional questions, please feel free to um, put them in the chat or uh, let me know. Thank you so much, Jamie, for presenting all that information. Yes, I'll just give everyone a moment just in case you have any questions. Feel free, like Jamie said, to send that in the chat typed up or in the Q&A feature at the bottom, and then we would be able to answer them live. And we'll just give it a few moments just in case anyone has anything that they want to ask. Absolutely. Alrighty. And then I see an attendee may be raising their hand. Feel free again. If you have a question, feel free to drop it here in the chat on the right hand side or in the Q&A at the bottom. And then if you do have any questions that come up after this presentation and after the event today, feel free to reach out to Jamie. Um, I believe you provided your contact information already as well. And at the end of the event, we will display the college's contact as well. Right. So if we don't have any more questions, we can go ahead and transition. Oh, it looks like we just actually got one. Go right oh. into the chat. Oh, in the Q&A. Okay. Um, in the Q&A, yes. Yeah, great question, Ruby. Um, so my answer to this obviously varies student by student, but I, I do encourage them to stay where they are um, to finish those selective admission criteria. Because I will say that, you know, when they come into that admissions queue, their transcripts are reviewed normally by the dean. Um, if he doesn't see those three classes for engineering or the two classes for uh, computing, he normally denies. Now I will say there's always a student who comes in with, you know, really, you know, for, especially for engineering, they'll have the calculus and the chemistry, but they won't have the physics and they'll have A's and B's in those. And he'll normally give them provisional admission. Um, again, that's a case by case situation. So I won't say that's like a norm that, you know, students will have, um, you know, two out of the three and they automatically get, that's not the norm. Um, I will also say, you know, again, with the programming class, those, we have a very long list of courses that you all offer that are different than our COP 2220. Again, it's a case by case situation, but I always encourage students to complete those requirements prior to even applying because I don't want them to waste their time and money applying and then just getting that denial. Um, and then let's see. Yeah, I mean, I never encourage students to apply as a different major if they're looking for one of our majors, mainly because of financial aid reasons. Now, if somebody is out there and they're like, I don't use any type of financial aid, which is in my experience, very rare um, because most of those courses are not required for 
different majors, except for other selective admission majors. Um, I tell them, you know, especially since they have the 60 credits, they can't be exploratory. Um, I just say, wait. Um, I mean, we do have a general studies degree. I don't know if that was covered by COAS that is in their college. I don't know much about it. Um, that one is kind of a pretty open, broad degree. So that may be um, an opportunity for students to kind of come to UNF if they're really, you know, wanting to get here um, without having those courses. So that could be an opportunity. I will defer to COAS and the admissions office on that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I normally don't recommend any other different majors here at UNF. Oh, uh, maximum allowed credits to transfer. Pretty sure it's 90 credits. Yes, I believe that might be more of an admissions question. <laughs> yeah, thank have... you, thank you. Yes, of course, <laughs> we can definitely have, um, we have our admissions recruiter that may be able to answer that directly into the chat. Um, but if you have any specific admissions related questions, we would be able to provide, again, that contact information at the end of the presentation if you want to reach out directly to our Office of Admissions. That way they can just double check and confirm um, those transfer credits. There are different levels of transfer students um, and so that will be good information that we can provide as well. All right. Do we have any more questions for College of Computing, Engineering, and Construction? All righty. Well, awesome. again, if you do thank have you all so come, much. Of course. Thank you so much, Jamie. If you have any more come up, reach out to College of Computing, Engineering, and Construction Advising or Jamie, um, and we will go ahead and transition into our last college presentation for the event. I would like to introduce Dr. Um, Kathy O'Farrell, who is the director of the College of Education and Human Services. And I will go ahead and share my screen for that PowerPoint presentation. Good morning, welcome. Um, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking to you about the different kinds of majors that we offer within the College of Education and Human Services and really concentrate on some new and exciting and innovative things that are happening within the college. So Elena, if you could go on. This is our building. Um, and these are the, the majors and the minors that we offer within the college. And what you see here are a number of majors that are limited access. All of our education majors, as well as our ASL English interpreting, are limited access majors. And um, the other majors are open. But one of the things I wanna mention about the limited access majors is that for all of our education majors, we have one prerequisite, and that is the EDF 1005, Introduction to the Teaching Profession. And um, we also have a, somewhat of a strange situation with early childhood education, which has two concentrations, pre-K primary licensure, which actually leads to a teaching license. And we also have special education um, majors, and we have a concentration there, exceptional student education, that leads to teacher licensure. However, in both of those majors, we have concentrations that do not lead to teacher licensure. And for early childhood education, that would be the early childhood development concentration that does not lead to teacher license. And in the special education major, it would be disability services that does not lead to teacher licensure. Um, and we do have a relatively new major, learning design and technology which is geared for students who want to incorpor incorporate aspects of education with technology. And the intent is to design or create different programs, different websites, different ways of communicating and bridging the gap between education and technology. 
And then of course we have our sport management program. And um, of all of our programs, we only have two programs that can be offered online. One is the early childhood development program. And the other is one of the sports management concentrations is actually offered online. Everything else is pretty much either a combination of in-person or online. And if it's an education program, it's pretty much face-to-face. -face. And then you'll see the different minors that we offer to complement different majors. These are not only open to our students within the College of Education and Human Services, but also to any students across the campus. Elena? Um, these are a couple of our points of pride. Um, we do have several living learning communities. These are open to our freshmen. And these are groups of students who reside together in our housing that have a, a, a similar theme that they would like to pursue. So we have our, our MAID LLC, which is Making a Difference in Education our ASL zone, which is for our students who are interested in signing, and Thrive, which is one of our um, programs. We have a, a number of specialty programs, and these work with challenged adults and, and challenged children. Uh, we also have several different kinds of labs on the campus, and we have our STEP lab, which stands for solving, tinkering, tinkering, exploring, and playing. And this is a technology-driven educational lab where our students have access to robotics, Legos, um, different ways of teaching through STEM. We also have our ASL lab, which is a non-speaking lab where people can hone and enhance their ASL skills. And we also have our data analytics lab, which is primarily for our sports management students because data analytics is a large area within sport management. Um, and we do have um, a very high level of placement with our students in local schools. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later on about our stipends for selected majors. But for all of our students, doesn't matter what their major may be, we have, we firmly believe in providing opportunities for our students to be fully immersed in their majors. And so they are participating in clinical experiences right from the very beginning. So whether they are in sport management, you know, they'll be out working with a sport organi organization or a sport agency if they are in education. They'll be out in classrooms. If they are in disability services, they'll be working with different community agencies. So no matter the major, we want to fully immerse them in their chosen career early on so they get a taste for what that major is like and those experiences actually become developmental in nature. So not only do they increase in terms of time within different sites, but the expectations change as students progress through their programs. We also, for those clinical experiences for our education majors, have a number of what we call professional development schools. And these are schools across the, the Northeast Florida region that we have entered into partnerships with. And we primarily use those schools as sites for our students to observe, to learn to teach, and um, also to help with research and working with the teachers in terms of their professional development as well. We are also the only public university in Florida that has an accredited bachelor's degree in American Sign Language, English Interpreting. And we have two concentrations there. We have our community interpreting and brand new is our education interpreting program. 
And we are also the only public university in Florida that offers a deaf education program. And our support management program, we're very proud, is ranked number four. And um, we are also one of only 33 programs across the world that is accredited by the Commission on Sport Management Accreditation. And we also have, kind of similar to Coggin, we have an executive in residence program within sport management. Um, and what that individual does, it's someone from the, the sports world that works closely with our students. They do some teaching, they do some mentoring. And of course, I, I mentioned our sport data analytics lab before. Elena? One of the things that is new um, is our Osprey Teacher Residency Program. And this is earn as you learn and learn as you do is kind of like the mantra for this particular program. And beginning with the junior year, students select into a number of different programs. So we have project prep, and actually project prep really begins in high school, and it is a continuum from high school all the way through doctoral programs. And it is designed primarily to build a pipeline of teachers for Clay County. And so with this particular program, if you are a rising junior or senior and you've been admitted into elementary education at this point, down the road, we hope to add additional majors, but for now it's elementary ed. Your field placement is in Clay County, and you can see what you get in terms of monetary compensation for being a junior in project prep and for being a senior in project prep. We also have our AmeriCorps junior teachers, um, and this is actually the Jacksonville Teacher Residency Program, but at the junior level. And so these are open to any of our education majors and um, including music ed. And for these particular students who are admitted into this particular program, the placement is in Duval, St. John's or Clay County. So we see a lot of students going into this particular program who may live in St. John's, may live in Duval, may live in Clay, or, or wish to do their experiences in any one of those three different counties. And you can see their monetary compensation for their junior year. And when we talk junior year, we're talking from the, the fall semester through the end of the spring semester. Once they get into senior status, then we actually have the Jacksonville Teacher Residency Program. And um, this one, again, is open to all education majors. It's a year-long service-oriented residency where these individuals um, actually not only are doing their field work and eventually their internship, in a particular school, but they also do additional work. They, uh, they volunteer, they have service learning projects, they're at the schools in terms of more days, more time. And um, this one is also open in Duval, St. John's and Clay for placement. And as you can see, the senior year benefits are quite substantial. We also, Project Prep also is available for our seniors. And then we have an accelerated program. And this is for students who are doing their fall internship only at the moment. And what it is, is we've partnered with River City Science Academy. And they are brought on in their senior year for their internship as an associate teacher. And so they are actually getting paid an associate teacher's salary and benefits. And you can see that over $40,000 that they get. And it is a two-year commitment because River City Science Academy will guarantee them that for the spring, 
they will continue in that position, but they will now be a full-time beginning teacher. And then they have to make an additional year commitment. And they could be at any one of the River City Science Academy campuses across the area. And so what this is designed to do is to actually help supplement our students who in the past have been in non-paid internships. And now this is an opportunity for them to be paid or to earn as they actually learn. And they can switch back and forth from these. Uh, a student could start in project prep at their junior year and switch to the accelerated program or switch to the Jacksonville teacher residency program and vice versa. So it's a wonderful opportunity. We have our first group of um, accelerated program students out at River City Science Academy this, this fall. And um, our first group of project prep students and our junior JTR students starting this fall. So we will be tracking this program closely, collecting data on it. And um, we're actually hoping that this will inspire others to enter the profession as we help them earn as they learn. Elena? Um, and this is some information about our, um, these are all of our contact information within the Office of Academic Support and Information Services, better known as the OASIS on campus. And all of our academic advisors are listed here as well. But I want to spend um, a little bit of time talking about some changes within the selected access program. So Elena, if you could go on. This is These are the requirements for our ASL English interpreting program. Um, and of course, it is a selective access program. And so to get in, you have to not only meet the admission requirements for admission to UNF, but there are other additional requirements you have to satisfy. You'll notice that these particular students have to have a GPA of a 2.75 or better. Our preference is 3.0 or better. Uh, and you have to have maintained a B in the number of courses that are listed there, ASL 1, 2, Intro to Interpreting, and ENC 1101, as well as having Bs in subsequent courses. Um, if a student has an AA, they will automatically transfer the C grades for those courses, and they're not required to repeat them. And, and so... The other aspects of this is that we do do, starting in the junior year, a limited access screening. This occurs in the spring. And students, in order to be eligible to even sit for the limited access screening, have to have already satisfied all of their prerequisites and their core requirement coursework in order to sit for that particular exam. If they pass the exam, then they are permitted to go on within that particular major. Um, if they don't, then we, they can either do one of two things. They can sit out for a year and gain more skills so that the next time around when they take the limited access screening exam, they will do better or they can look at changing their major. So it is a pretty stringent program. And as I mentioned before, there are now two concentrations, the community interpreting and the education interpreting. So Elena. And um, this again, just reiterates the program admission screening and we do, as I said, it's done in the spring. They have to apply by March 31st. And then the screening occurs in April. 
And as you can see there, there are written portions of the exam. They are ASL exercises that they have to conduct. There's a video interview that they have to do. And then those components are all scored together to look at their ability to communicate through ASL. Uh, these are, um, we have partnered with the Duval County Schools for a number of test prep courses, and these are the ones for the fall. But what I want to mention here is that in the past, in order to be admitted into an education major, you had to have at least a 2.5, you had to have reached 60 credit hours and passed the general knowledge exam. Starting this spring, the general knowledge exam is no longer being required as an admissions requirement into an education major. It, it, it will still have to be passed before a student can graduate along with the professional ed exam and the subject area exam. But now it will be more of a gatekeeper requirement. And what I mean by that is this, that a student could be admitted into an education major without having taken or passed the GK, and they will have up through the end of their junior year to take that exam and pass it. At the end of that period of time, if they have not passed the exam, they will no longer be permitted to remain in the program. And so they would have to look at a different major at that point. But the thinking here is that hopefully our native students and lower level transfer students will still take that general knowledge exam early because the information that is tested on that exam is closer to what they have experienced with the SAT or the ACT. And so the further removed you are from that information, the more challenging that exam becomes. So hopefully the push will still be for those lower level and native students to take that exam before they hit the junior status. But for the transfer students, it gives them an additional amount of time to avail themselves of the resources that we have here for them to help them pass that exam. And here, as you can see in this calendar, are some of the prep sessions that we conduct. These are the ones that we do concurrently with the Duval County School System. And you can see the different tests that we offer. And some of these are virtual. These are all virtual, but we've also done virtual and in-person. So there's a combination and some of them we also offer in person. We do do on a weekly basis, we have our Zoom GK drop-in sessions where students can drop in and learn about the exam and get some knowledge about it in terms of how it's constructed, what they're looking for, the contents of it, different test strategies. And we also offer a number of tutoring projects that will help them with very specific areas that they may need work in. And some of those we also offer for the professional ed exam as well as the different subject area exams. But this is important because it hopefully it will allow students to pursue education but also give them that additional time. But we will continually be working with these students because what we don't want to have happen is them get to the end of that junior year and then have to choose a different major at that point. Elena? So this is what I just mentioned before to you. Um, and if, Anyone 
wants to get more information about our resources that are available for the general knowledge exam, Jade Ewan within the Office of Academic Support and Information Services is our contact for the general knowledge exam. And you can see her email address there. And um, the goal here is to help them as much as possible to provide as much support as we possibly can for those students. So not only in terms of getting admitted into the program, but also helping them to subsidize their time within the program through our Osprey teacher residency programs. And these are really year long internships. Lena. And this is our contact information. And you see Jade's contact information there as well. Questions. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Farrell. It looks like we do have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, again, feel free to send in the chat or that Q&A feature at the bottom if you have any questions. Our first question is, can you give examples of the weekly program or internship hours for each of the Osprey teacher residency programs outside of the River City full-time position? And do the students attend part-time or full-time courses while earning as they learn? Okay, I'm gonna deal with the, the last question first there. Um, these are full-time courses that they, they are taking. So every semester they have a block of courses that they are required to take. And these programs actually incorporate those courses. So there's always some type of field course associated with uh, one of the education majors every semester. So, for example, for the educate uh, the elementary ed majors, they have three field courses: field one, two, and three. In each semester, they're taking one, and then they finish up with their full time internship. So, for any of the field courses, whether that's in elementary or secondary, they are actually out at the school at least one day a week, full time for that one day. Um, and then for the Jacksonville Teacher Residency Program, they are there for their field courses twice a week. Now, of course, students sometimes go longer than that if they desire or if they have additional requirements and assignments that they have to complete. So they may be out there um, they may be out at a school on a different day doing work for another one of their courses that requires some work within a school, such as if they are taking um, one of the, the TESOL courses. There are certain numbers of hours, field hours that are associated with them so that they're out there as well, in addition to their one day for their field components. But the minimum amount that they would be out there at any given time outside of the final internship would be one complete day. The internship is full time. And so they're out there Monday through Friday from the start of the school day to the end of the school day. And they are following the teacher's hours and they are under the direction of a mentor teacher as well as one of the university supervisors. And so they, they we've tried to incorporate a lot of the assignments for their courses within what they're doing in their field site. So what they're learning in their courses is now being put into practice within their field sites. And so the field site becomes the vehicle through which they are accomplishing these tasks. For the field courses, there's also a weekly seminar. And those weekly seminars, for the most part, are held on campus late in the afternoon or in the early evenings. And this is a, an opportunity for them to learn some things as well as to debrief about their particular experiences in the schools that week. Um, yes, uh, we do have some um, 
education majors as well as non-education majors that have ASL minors. And it looks like we have a question in the chat. Um, They're asking, do you generally see a high number of students having to change their major as a result of not passing the GK? And additionally, how does impact retention in this program? Um, one of the things that we see happening is that students who want to enter one of the education majors and haven't passed the GK yet, we do do have some majors that they go into kind of on a temporary basis until they pass the GK. Um, they've spent some time in either early childhood development or disability services. Some of those courses overlap the um, courses in the education majors. And, um, and soon, once the we have everything situated with the general studies degree, that might be another option for students. But right now, if they haven't passed the GK, they go into one of those majors that I mentioned. And um, hopefully by availing themselves of the resources, they would pass the GK and then be able to be admitted into the program. Um, I typically will see students all the time who have taken the exam and passed it and now want to move on into um, an education major. So I, I can't really speak to there's a high number of students having to change their major. They, they've they've not been admitted yet into that major. And so they're they're spending that additional time in the other major. It's usually one semester and then they move in. Now, I have no data on how uh, what's going to happen with this new change in having the GK be a gatekeeper rather than an admissions requirement. Um, so we'll see at the end of the their junior years how many of those individuals are caught out at that point. I'm, I'm hoping that we have very few of those students. Great, great question. Um, and in terms of retention in the program, once they're in, once they've passed the GK, um, the majority of them will exit the program. They don't seem to have the difficulty with the exit exams, the professional ed or the subject area exam. At the outcome to the end of a semester, and there may be less than a handful of students who um, have not yet passed either the professional ed or the subject area, but they'll take it again and they do better the second time around. All righty. If we have any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A. We'll give another moment. But as always, of course, if we do not get to any questions that you may have today during this event or following the event, we will be um, showing the college's contact information as we conclude this virtual event today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. O'Farrell, for joining us today to present for the College of Education and Human Services. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, I will go ahead and transition to our closing remarks and provide you with some final information before you all log off the webinar today. Thank you again, Dr. O'Farrell. Thank you. Thank you. Just give me one moment and I'll be able to share with you all just some final contact information and to be able to provide us with any feedback today. And let me share my screen. Right. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, for our presenters, for taking the time to share all the wonderful information regarding transferring to UNF and our academic programs. And thank you all for joining us for this virtual event today. As mentioned, here's a good slide to be able to reach out to any of our colleges. College of Arts and Sciences, Brooks, Coggin, CCEC, College of Education and Human Services. And we also do have our Hicks Honors College for any students that may be interested in joining the Hicks Honors College at UNF. 
feel free to take a photo or a screenshot of the following slide if you have any more questions that we didn't get to today or any that come up after this event. In addition, um, we do have websites where you can feel free to check them out for more information. I will go ahead and drop those in the chat for you all. Alrighty. And you can check out any of these areas respective official web pages um, for more information. And then I've also dropped as well our UNF admissions webpage and our UNF campus tours and special events webpage as well if you're interested in visiting our campus for a tour or a special event. Lastly, if you would like to provide us with some feedback of what you thought about the event today, feel free to uh, provide us with a response to our event survey, which I'll also be dropping in the chat. And you should also receive an email following this event um, with that link as well. And again, thank you so much for attending our virtual Connect with UNF Transfer Admissions Articulation Workshop event today. And we hope you all enjoy the rest of your days.